Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as you have probably noticed, uh, one of the important things for me, which I thought was important when I was putting this and the whole thing together, was to have an opportunity to introduce you to the people and to have people work with you, people who are really blazing the path in the area. People not just experts in one or another aspect of what they're doing, people not who have, okay, we have good contribution, or people who are the reigning kings in the area, although that is still there, but people who have opened new areas of inquiries, who have asked new questions, who have uh, profoundly changed the understanding of what we think is or was the Mediterranean. And uh, I think uh, there's no better example than this that Professor Matar over here, a noted scholar who made an impact and a splash in the entire way we understand the Mediterranean history, particularly in the ways of, condition, uh, of conversion, but in uh, many other ways as well. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to have him here today and a great honor uh, to share his expertise with us. Uh, Professor Matai is one of the people, I'm not going to go and enumerate everything that he has produced and will produce, right? Uh, there is a short synopsis on the Institute website, the running website right now, and uh, I assume you have looked at it and you can still look in, under the staff feature. But I'd like to say, I always like this, uh, that Professor Mataf is one of these people whose bibliography needs a caravan of mules to be you know, moved, or, 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 or camels, or whatever you have, right? But given the way that uh, he shared with me that he continues to work, and of course we know that he continues to work, I mean to upgrade this metaphor to some more spacious and modern means of transportation. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to um, uh, welcome here, and as Professor Matar is actually in Minnesota, and good standing, just like me, you know, 50 years or something here, you can also welcome us Minnesota, Professor Matar. Okay. Thank you so much, Pedro. Thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm honored, actually, because this is really a wonderful group from the biography, the bios I saw, and the project that is being undertaken is really uh, quite important, and I think needs to be further investigated, so I'm glad most of you, if not all of you, are working within that sphere. Uh, I just want to, you know, I looked at the list of presenters. I think I'm the only one who teaches literally 80 miles down from here. So I want to welcome you to Minnesota. It's a lovely state, not in January, <laughs> on a day like this. So uh, you know, I hope you enjoy it and enjoy your stay here. Uh, my interest in conversion, there are two interests in my life. And if you look at my work in the past 25 years or so, there have been two major dominant interests uh, in terms of religious encounters, engagements in the Mediterranean region. Um, one of them is captivity. I've done a lot on captivity literature, and uh, because I was once myself a captive, so it kind of inspired my work. And the other is conversion, because I come from a family of literally three religious backgrounds. So it's been always a fascinating area for me to uh, indulge in and explore. And as I said, you know, 25 years or six, 25, six years ago, when I wrote my first, one of my first articles was on conversion in early modern England, and it became a chapter in my first book on Islam in Britain in 1998. So this is a, an interest that I've had for a very long time. Uh, the point is that conversion is a very unsettling topic. It stirs up emotions, and I never thought of it that way, as I say, because my experience with my extended family, spouse, and relatives, etc., who, as I say, I've seen, I've attended conversions of many, not many, some. <laughs> uh, and so, it, as I say, it's been part of my life, and yet, um, in the project I'm working on now, of which this is part, uh, the issue of conversion, I realize, and the issue of religious uh, identity has come up quite frequently, and I notice that some people are irritated by it, and kind of actually react to it. Uh, I'm working aside, alongside this on uh, you know, the chapter that I sent you on Jewish conversion to Christianity and Catholic writings, Catholic and historian. Uh, I'm also working on the Protestant Reformation in Arab eyes. I mean, all my projects now are basically on Arab sources, Arabic sources. And when I send them to colleagues and friends, I get sometimes what I sense to be not terribly happy uh, emotions. 
I mean, it's not that the comments, comments are always helpful, but somehow I sense they don't like that. So, and I know many of you are planning to use this material or what you are taking from this uh, series of lectures here into your classroom, so just kind of be aware that it is rather a sensitive subject and to some people it's quite unsettling. The reason is because, and the title, and that's why the title of my paper, The Silent War. Uh, in a sense, working in the Mediterranean is working in a region where historically the two largest religions of conversionary efforts, Islam and Christianity, were cheek by jaw. They were together. They were there, across from each other, next to each other. Judaism, of course, a very, very small community, which did not have the dynamism or the ability to effect uh, conversions. But uh, Christianity and Islam, along with Buddhism, are the, the most conversion religions in the world. And here it was in the early modern period, as it is today, although I don't want to push into today's uh, scene, but obviously if you read the newspapers, often some of these themes are there, that conversion was always there at the forefront of the encounters. Which is why I said it's a silent war. It was a silent war in one way, and I'll describe that. But it was also often, or on many occasions, a very vociferous war and also sometimes a violent war. Now, I sent you an outline of the paper. Uh, I will be asking five questions, and I have in bold the questions that I wish to discuss with you later in our workshop. So I hope you'll be thinking about that. So I'm just going to go over them very quickly. I see some of you have your computers, others. I don't know if you were able to print them out. but. Um, you know, there'd be five questions about, you know, what conversion actually means in the early modern period, uh, why did people convert, what is the role of political geography in conversion, uh, how do people convert, what's the function of proselytization, and finally, because it's the kind of silent war, you know, who won the war. And in bold, however, I have the questions for discussion. Discussion one. You know, and these are based on the readings that I hope you have had time to go over them. And particularly because I noticed some of you are from art history, I kind of dug up, it wasn't easy finding pictures of converts, so I kind of dug up whatever I had in my files, and I'd be very interested in your views on how you would view these pictures, how you do kind of interpret these pictures of converts that are available uh, uh, to us. So anyway, uh, please do bring that with you when we meet in our discussions this afternoon and tomorrow morning. The Mediterranean world of the period we are studying begins with a series of land and sea wars between the Ottomans and the Byzantines, the Mamluks and the Habsburgs in that order that covered the Middle East, and we're going to have a map of the Mediterranean, that covered the Middle East, North Africa and Eastern and Central Europe. <laughs> There were also wars in the 16th and 17th centuries between Protestants and Catholics in Western Europe, the wars of religion. The period ends with the beginning of what historians have called the, the Second Hundred Years' War between the European superpowers, France and Britain. And some would kind of maintain that it started in, in 1689 and ended with Waterloo in uh, 1815. In between, there were the small wars of Mediterranean piracies and wars among the North African regencies, and at the far end, uh, the eastern kind of end, Ottoman Safafid wars. At the same time, there was another war, a rather silent war going on around the Mediterranean basin, the war to convert others to your religion. This war was a war in which Christians, Muslims, and Jews were all involved, although the most effective actors were the Christians and the Muslims because of their vastly larger populations. And because these two religions, along with Buddhism, which is what I mentioned, as the Oxford Handbook of Religious Conversions states, have been the most, and I quote, missionary religions in the world. It was a silent war, but one that had, that kind of had massive and tragic implications. Again, it's curious how our period is bookended 
by two acts of conversion and violence. In 1492, the forcible baptism of the Jewish population in Spain, and in 1502, the forcible baptism of the larger Muslim population, too, again, of Al-Andalus, of Spain. And those who refused to convert were expelled. And in 1685, the expulsion of the French Protestants from Catholic France, the Huguenots. In between, there was a seizure of Christian children who were converted and trained into high offices at the Ottoman court, becoming the famous Genesis. There were, of course, happy conversions in fiction as in reality. Cervantes, and I know one of you is working on Cervantes, told the story of the Catholic captain who fled from Algiers with the Muslim daughter of the Imam, who subsequently converted to Christianity. But somehow she never says anything in that whole episode. <laughs> And there was a Syrian Catholic youth. Now, this is a real episode. His name was Boulos al-Anida, whose age was 15. He went to Rome, where he studied philosophy and theology at the famous Maronite College. In 1584, uh, Pope Gregory XIII established a college in Rome to train Maronites, which is kind of Catholic, children from Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine, kind of Bilad al-Sham, the largest group, to train in uh, post-Tridentine theology and then go back to, the, to their homeland and preach there and kind of minister to their congregation. So he was one of them, he was sent at 15. When he returned to Aleppo, instead of joining the priesthood as he was expected, he fell in love with a Muslim woman, converted to Islam, and married her. As one historian succinctly put it in the Mediterranean basin, quote, Competition for women and competition for converts are related. End of quote. On the subject of the Mediterranean and the parameters of my presentation today, I want to start with three observations about the name of the Mediterranean, the languages of the Mediterranean, and the problematics of conversion in the Mediterranean. First, in regard to the name Mediterranean. This is, of course, a Eurocentric concept and nomenclature, the media terrae of the Roman Empire and of later European successors, the sea in between the land, basically the Roman lands. But in the period we are studying, 14-1700, over two-thirds of the Mediterranean was sailed and its shores inhabited by peoples who had no idea about the media terrae. For the Romans, the sea was a wide sea. For the Arabs, now this is, I'm sure some of you have seen that before. For the Arabs, the sea was either the Rumi Sea, the Shami Sea, Rumi means kind of Byzantine, Shami means Syrian Sea, or the Green Sea, or sometimes even the Salty Sea. Uh, have you seen that? Can you? Any suggestions why it looks this odd way? It's not really odd. Just why is it? Yeah, south it's south upside down. Yes, yeah. the north is south and south is north. So basically, this is the Mediterranean. Okay, that's the Arabian Peninsula. That's where. And so, as I say, here you have the ten names, and this is the Shami Sea, the Rumi Sea, and the very other. And in Arabic writings, I say you always find, you never find, never in this period under study. And I've kind of looked at that very carefully. You never study, you never find the name the Mediterranean, the Mutawassa, the in between sea. It's always either the Shami Sea, which is the Syrian Sea, the Rumi Sea. For the Moroccans, it was often the Salty Sea, for some obscure reason, <coughs> or local seas. But it was never that kind of larger conceptualization of the sea. Yes, this is the Idrisi map, 12th century. It's a very famous one, you can find it online. Uh, but what's famous, about, what's important about it is kind of it delineates the world in a way that had not yet been delineated in any other uh, cartography in the world. What is in a name? You know, because I'm suggesting that we have a different name for the sea. Juliet, you will be aware, Juliet asked of Romeo. <laughs> and the answer is a lot. And it just happened that last week. I don't know if you keep track of the news. I'm sure Kirill will keep track of the news. What is in a name? A lot in Macedonia's case. Uh, 
you know, they were about to reach an agreement, calling Macedonia North Macedonia, and the Greek, and then the president of, Ma of Macedonia decided against that. So now Macedonia cannot join the EU unless it changes its name. So there's a lot in what the name means. So as I say, just think of this. Uh, and, you know, different names signify different conceptualizations of power, of ownership, of accessibility, and of identity. Secondly, languages. I'm going to go back to the, this one. On the European, Asiatic, and African side, the language was Arabic. And of course, with Dutch, uh, with, Dutch with Turkish. And some Syriac in the Christian regions. Uh, I gather you had Carla speaking about the, uh, Lingua Franca in the kind of maritime region. But Lingua Franca was not a written. These were written languages. On the European side, there were different languages, without anything like Arabic to unite, because Arabic is a language of the Quran. Basically, any Muslim would have had some familiarity. Some could be extensive, could be limited with some. <clears throat> Again, two thirds of the Mediterranean. This is something we always forget. Two thirds, because all this region is also under Ottoman rule. In the 2000 Mediterranean period we are studying, spoke and wrote Arabic and or Turkish. Yet the sources that have been studied and used by scholars for the study of the modern Mediterranean have been largely European. Only recently, and many of you are involved in that kind of enterprise, have the non-European sources begun to be consulted. Uh, there is, of course, one supreme work that all of you would know or need to know, the work by Fernand Brodel, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean one. I have a copy. I brought a couple of books here just in case later you want to kind of look at them. Uh, that's the supreme work on the Mediterranean. And what has been done since I don't think matches up to what he had done in 1949. It's a supreme work. But Brodel, by the way, admitted that he had not consulted or used Turkish or Arabic material. And neither, rather, rather strangely, did recent writers who attempted the study of the Mediterranean. Hoden and Purcell and Abu Lafia, again, I mean, Hoden and Purcell, in a huge book, have one sentence on Arabic sources, <laughs> Abu Lafia completely. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. Uh, and Brodel was modest enough to say, I don't know Ottoman, I don't know Arabic, I haven't consulted them, I hope others will. And so that's it. So working with European sources leads to a Euro Eurocentric perspective. Would our perspective be different if the title of this conference by the NEH was Modernity and Transformation in the White Sea? What would that mean? Finally, conversion. Conversion is a highly complicated subject to study for two reasons. Because it's variable from one country to another, one religious community to another, one period to another, one person to another. Okay. There was conversion among all peoples of the Mediterranean and beyond. Children, and as I say, I would like to discuss these illustrations with you. The child being converted, men and women. I don't have women, by the way, pictures, but they're men. Here is famous text by a Shia Catholic, he was a Persian ambassador, uh, who converts to Catholicism and stays in Spain uh, you know, at the beginning of the uh, 17th century. Old and young. This is supposedly uh, a Christian convert to Islam. Uh, again, the illustration is a European illustration. It says nothing by Muslim hands that at least I could find. So a kind of you know an old man being celebrated in his in his conversion, old and young. We'll look at that much more carefully. I have it actually in color, but I couldn't I don't know how to use a computer, so that's why it ended up being in black and white. There were sailors and captives, soldiers and job seekers, common and noble, uh, Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox and Jacobite, Muslim and Jewish, merchants and princes. This is the, as you can see, Morocco, the son of the king of Morocco, who uh, dies in uh, 1621. 
and who fled to, uh, to Spain and converted. Uh, priests and rabbis and imams, I mean, there's everyone. And of course, there were, kind of, as you've seen, all these are individual conversions. Do you know who that is? Okay, I, want, I will discuss that later, because I just added it in contrast with the other. And mass conversion. This is a famous depiction of the mass conversion of the Moriscos in Spain. As you can see, these are the kind of the Muslims, and this is the priesthood forcibly converting them uh, in 1502. I'll come back to that in a while. And there were pirates who converted. And of course, you've had, I think, a talk about piracy. Uh, now, this is not John Ward, so please do keep that in mind, but he's a very famous English pirate. He uh, was an Englishman operating out of his base in Tunis, recruiting Christian and Muslim pirates. He became so successful that he decided to settle in Tunis, and so he converted, built himself a magnificent palace, surrounded himself with a harem. He became the envy of Londoners. It's not like he was denounced for what he's done. He becomes the envy of Londoners with ballads celebrating his glory, all the world about the third of Danziker. He was his companion. Danziker was Dutch. Captain Ward was English. And their proud adventure. There's songs in London about this convert who's made it big at the time. Converts were from everywhere, and conversion occur occurred everywhere. In Rome, as in Tunis, in London, as in Istanbul, in Venice, as in Cairo, in Rabat, as in Mount Lebanon. As you have seen in the reading about the conversion of Jews, the paper I sent you, the geography of conversion extended from Iraq to Palestine to Tunisia. The second reason it is complicated is because it was silent. Converts rarely spoke or wrote about themselves or their experiences. Numberless are those who converted, assimilated, and are, un and are unknown in history. Most often, for scholars today, the only way converts are known is by outside references, which has made the study of conversion either micro-historical, statistical, or in modern times, particularly as conversion becomes an issue in political assimilation, uh, becomes sociological. But conversion was a private action, located in a private narrative, which is why the readings I chose focus on the personal narrative. In the case of the Jewish convert, in the chapter I sent you, it's still in progress, by the way, and I apologize for the few typos in it, but uh, the last kind of account is a unique account, as far as I know, in Arabic, of somebody, uh, of a Jew describing his, his journey to Christianity. I found similar accounts of Muslims named the journey to, uh, to Christianity, but this was a unique account in, um, about Judaism. What did the convert say or write? in his own words, in his own idiom. Not what an outsider said or observed, but what the convert believed about himself, and how readers, recipients, came to understand conversion through his mediation. In this context, it's important to remember to avoid hearsay. As one historian has noted, information about converts, especially when they were secretive, i.e. crypto-Jewish, crypto-Muslim, crypto, -Muslim, crypto -Muslim, Christian, when you have information, it's usually, according to that historian, mostly handed down by European missionaries and travelers. End of quote. Such information needs to be heavily scrutinized. So that's why I will present uh, a number of themes relating to and interrogating our three conversion texts, and will raise questions which we will discuss hopefully later today. What did conversion mean? So this is my first question. What did conversion mean in the early modern period? And the focus, I say, is mainly on Christian and, uh, and Muslim, simply because this is a larger kind of project in terms of conversion in the early modern period, and within the Christian, both Catholic and Protestant. Uh, and the importance here is to begin to emphasize the difference in the idea of conversion. Conversion is used so easily, so kind of randomly. You know, somebody converted from X and Y. Well, that's true. They convert, they change. But what does conversion actually entail? In Christianity, conversion, the word convertire, turning around, turning the sinner to God. This is how actually it was in, uh, in Middle English. 
And so conversion is kind of a change, it, it kind of a violent change of direction. That's one. The kind of negative side of that term is the term apostasy, uh, which is kind of the conversion from the other perspective. And you find that very much in English and in French, turning Turk, uh, donned the Turk. The idea is kind of negative, hostile, um, you know, perspective on, on the convert. And again, in English you get, you know, renegade, rene I mean, that's coming from Spanish as well, renegade. So, I mean, the whole point is that there, there's a kind of negativity about conversion. And that's why the term renegade is often used. And it's a quite kind of question whether, you know, should we continue to use that term? This is a wonderful book, an excellent book uh, by Tobias Kraft. But, you know, my, my kind of concern with it is why do we have that title. Renegade is, as I say, a kind of a negative, a hostile term to use. Why not simply Christian European converts to Islam? Why use the term renegade? Should we use the term renegade? Again, that's something. I must confess, in my first article that I mentioned earlier, I myself had used that. Over the years, I've decided we should not be using that. It's kind of a negative term that is uh, unwarranted for that. Um, and then we get to the third, and we're still in the Christian unit, proselytization, the action to convert. The assumption, of course, is when I go out to, con to proselytize that you are a kind of a tabula rasa, you, there's nothing out there, and I'm going to kind of impose on you to grant you to give you the, the, the right uh, faith, that you have nothing there uh, instead. Now, this is the Christian terminology. Convert, apostate, proselytize. In Islam, the word is very different. And I have that, I wrote that for you on the, uh, on the outline. Ihtida. Ihtida. Both in Arabic, actually, and in Turkish, that you find the convert is the muhtadi, the one. And this is a very, it's a much gentler, it's a much different, it's a much subtler term. Ihtida meaning to be led to the right way. Uh, if you think of the opening prayer in the Quran, uh, and in the Fatiha, Ihdina Surata Mustaqim, guidance, you know, grant us guidance to this straight path of Islam. Uh, again, you find it frequently, uh, Allahu Yahdi Man Yasha, God guides whomever He wishes. So there is the emphasis more in convert, in the, in the Christian context, it's, you know, I convert, I turn around, I kind of move with that. In the Islamic, the, the term that is used there is more that, it's God who's doing that in me. Hidayah. Uh, and of course, muhtadi, ihtada, you also have the word gift from it. Hada, you know, to give a gift. So it's like God gives you the gift of con conversion. Uh, in nearly all the letters, the kind of correspondence sent by North Africans to uh, European monarchs, if they were on good terms, uh, they would always start, you know, with uh, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, you know, Assalamu ala man man ihtada. You know, they they don't want to say, uh, you know, you're unbelievable. Say, well, let's just say that peace be on you, in the hope that you will be guided. So the idea in Arabic is, is a very different idea than it is in, in Islam, than it's in Christianity. For the equivalent of, of apostate, there is the word irtadda. Kind of this is where kind of the idea of turning against, going back against. And that would be the equivalent to renegade in, in, in English. Now, the, interestingly, again, in Islamic Arabic, and by the way, there's a difference sometimes between Islamic Arabic and Christian Arabic, but I'm focusing here on Islamic Arabic, uh, the idea of tansir, to Christianize. And that appears frequently in Arabic sources, that somebody was nusira, which has this very violent act. It's as if it's something that was done unto you uh, in being in turn, in turn Christian. And what's interesting is that there is no equivalent to what we have in English, Islamicized. We don't have an Arabic equivalent to that. that the idea is not there. So conversion and ihtidah are therefore quite different.
difference. Why? The answer is theological. So I'm going to start with the Muslim side of the theology and then move to the Christian side of the theology. In Islamic theology, all people, Christian, Jews, pagans, and others, are Muslim. They're all submitted to God. By fitrah, this is the way you are born. You are born submitting to God uh, by their very human nature. But what has happened is that they have lost their way, forgotten about God, and simply need to be enlightened back to his straight path, surat al mustaqim the doctrine is that all humans, and this is very much fundamental to the Quranic conception of man's relationship to, to God, is that the doctrine is that uh, all humans are created with submission to God, but they are by their very nature forgetful. It's not a matter of sin, and that's very important to distinguish that, because in Christian background, you know, it's always the idea of sin. There's no sin. It's, it's a matter that you forget about God. You know, somehow you get too busy with things. And therefore, what you need is simply, you know, just to be led back, just to be guided by him, just to be given the gift of guidance back to him. So to return to God, what's required is a single statement. And this is something we're going to have to look at a bit carefully. You know, it's often seen that in you know, conversion of Islam is a very easy thing. It's a very kind of you know, simple thing. Just one sentence. And that one sentence is, I, I witness there is one God, and there is, uh, and Muhammad is his prophet. By witnessing, however, what you've done is you have remembered God. So once you say that, you've remembered God, therefore, you're back to being what you are by your very nature, Muslim. It's a reminder that you accept, you've remembered God, but also, because then you're saying, I also accept that Muhammad is his prophet, you accept the concept of prophecy. And by accepting the concept of prophecy, you accept the prophets from the very beginning of monotheistic history until the end. For the Quran, the end is, of course, Muhammad. For the beginning, it's Adam. So it's Adam, it's Moses, it's Abraham, it's Moses, it's David, it's Solomon, it's all the list that you find in the Hebrew Scriptures, along with many other prophets who are not mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures. All these are the same. What they are all doing is reminding us of God. So when you witness, you're not just witnessing that there is a God, you're not just remembering that, but you're remembering the whole sequence of prophets. And of course, the most, I'm not going to say the most important, but the most recognized would be David, would be uh, Moses, would be Jesus, and would be Muhammad, simply because they're seen as prophets who had a written message. They were prophets of a book. So in Islam, conversion is simply remembrance of all the prophets in God's history with monotheism. Now to Christianity. Conversion is an education which takes time. Which is why the eager Muslim or the Jew who wants to convert, remember in our reading, both Ishmael and Musa Ishmael becomes James, Musa becomes uh, Butros. Both of them had to wait even after they had declared their intention to convert. Both of them wanted to convert, but they couldn't just be converted immediately. They had to go through a process. They had to wait because they had to undergo a set of instructions about a new doctrine, a new theology, about sin, salvation, redemption, grace, incarnation, crucifixion, predestination, free will, election, etc. But there's a whole set of new teachings that you have to acquire before you become a Christian. So it's an innovation, unlike in Islam, which is a remembrance. Ishmael became James only after he had learned the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Nicene Creed. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This is a tough, tough, tough text. I mean, what did he understand by, if you memorize it, I mean, again, we remember his English, at least as far as the text tells us, his English is rather poor. But, uh, yes, I mean, these kind of highlighted passages, and these were the, at the heart of Christian controversy for, literally, for centuries before they were finally confirmed. And of course, 
these are not necessarily accepted by all Christians. They're accepted by the kind of Western tradition of Orthodox Catholic Protestant, but the Eastern traditions of the Coptic, the, uh, the, the uh, Jacobite, the Nestorian, challenge this in one way. But what would that have meant to Ishmael, to the guy we read about, God from God, light from light, through God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Every side. Of course, what he made of this, as I say, we don't know. But the bottom line, it was not a single statement. Not a vision of immediacy. Not an instantaneous act, as with the Muslim, with the convert to Islam. James and Bulos, as they became, had to be catechized. And that took a lot of time and dedication. Paradoxically, it's kind of curious, this requirement is completely opposite to the iconic model in Christian history of Saul, you know, St. Paul, on his way to becoming Paul. As I'm sure you're familiar with that, but this idea, this is the, the iconic image of Christian conversion, which really, in history, is not kind of substantial. This is, of course, the image of Saul on his way to Excuse me, on his way to Damascus, as he was kind of about to persecute Christians, and you know, that's the famous scene where Jesus appears to him in a vision, you know, why are you persecuting me, etc. Uh, this is kind of Agio, it's a very famous one. This is one in Rome, there are a couple of other versions of it. I can never make sense of why it is that Paul, when he falls off the horse, has to go naked. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of, it looks kind of, you know, Indian like. I mean, you know, what he's wearing here, and he has a kind of Spanish-like element. I can't figure it out, I find it fascinating, but, you know. But this iconic image is really not at all what applies in Christian history of conversion. Or, of course, I'm sure many of you remember the figure of Augustine. He was in Milan, he was, you know, he had been reading, he had been influenced by his mother, etc., and then he opens the book, literally, and he sees a passage from that, and he converts. Like instantaneous. So these two iconic moments in Christian kind of iconography of, of conversion are not replicated in the actual history of Christian conversion down the centuries. Rather, conversion in our text, both the Bulus text and the James text, is a systematic education about faith, a transformation, a project of self-reconstruction. For the Muslim or the Jew to turn Christian, he had to learn something completely new. And in the course of that learning, he would become a new person, completely shedding and renouncing the old. And for those who might be familiar with the New Testament, the image of the new Adam that comes up. This is basically what conversion is. You're going to become a new person. James had to wait, as you remember from the text, eight months before he was accepted into conversion. Be patient, he was told on various occasions when he pleaded to be baptized. In the case of the disputation between Christians and Jews, the other units that I have in the chapter I sent you, there were arguments and syllogisms, discussions and proofs. Contrast those with Osman. The third text we have, the two letters by Thomas Darko, basically Osman, Osman Darko. That's how you And this is the question I want to raise with you, and it's on your uh, handout. Do you feel that in his letters he was different from any other Christian Frenchman in Tunis. Had he been transformed? Does his difference from James and Bulus have anything to do with the nature of the religion to which he converted? So in conclusion to this first question as to what conversion entails, never treat conversion as the same in all religions. When scholars speak of conversion, the first question to ask into which religion and what does conversion to that religion in day. To convert to Buddhism, or Christianity, or Islam, or Judaism is quite different and distinct. It's like comparing apples and oranges, and nectarines, and any other fruit you like. Without contrast, without contrasting these modes of conversion, you're bound to fall, in my view, you're bound to fall into error. Second question. Why did they convert? And in this, I exclude forcible conversion. Because in the Mediterranean, there are lots of forcible conversions. I don't want to go into that, because that's kind of beyond the scope of 
how I'm thinking or how conversion should be understood. So why did they convert? James and Boulos both told us why they converted. Their explanations raise the question of honesty, scrutiny, authenticity. And how, how much do you believe? How sincere were they or others in their description of the religious journey to a new theology? The account by James is full, and I'm sure you've noticed that, of misremembered re facts, deliberate falsehoods, and exaggeration. Some of them are just outrageous. I mean, it's as if he didn't know anything about Islam, uh, from what he's saying. Still, it's the way, and that's what's important, it's the way he liked to remember his own experience, and the way that the English Bible, because he, as you remember, he dictated this text so that he can raise some money. And so the way in which he wanted, the English buyers of his pamphlet came to understand conversion, what it meant to convert from Islam to Christianity. The three texts raise another question. So there's the issue of honesty, which is problematic. How do you know, you know that they're saying the truth? But the other question, was the conversion of the three men a purely psychological phenomenon? A willful desire to change identity? Or was it part of a social reconfiguration? A desire on the part of the convert to move out, go elsewhere, physically, geographically. As the texts show, both James and Osman had to leave their homelands in order to live as Christians or Muslims. They could not stay in or return to the Ottoman Empire in the case of uh, Ishmael, James, or to France in the case of Thomas Osman. Such mobility only became possible in the early modern period, at a time of advancing naval technology, maritime knowledge, travel, trade, and exposure. Both St. Paul and Augusta stayed within the boundaries of the Roman Empire, but the early modern period made possible movement between empires and settlement in new lands, new languages, new social customs. James traveled between Istanbul, Izmir, Tunis, Algiers, Madrid, Oporto and Portugal, Dover, London, The Hague, and Edinburgh. Seven countries, five languages, and if we are to believe him, which we shouldn't, but if we are to believe him, <laughs> he dabbled in French, Italian, and Latin. Along with Osman and Boulos, in other words, the French and the uh, Jewish, uh, the Muslim and the Jewish convert, they all made a choice to change themselves, not only in regard to where they would live, the clothes they would wear. Immediately you change your clothes in any kind of conversion you undertook, and we'll talk about that later. The looks they would have. Remember, uh, Ishmael had to shave off his beard. He's been used all his life to have a beard. Now he's going to be beardless. He shaves it, shaves his head. So it's kind of, it's going to see himself in the mirror, it's complete, it's different. Uh, they would also have to renounce their families. You know, uh, James Ishmael had a wife and two kids, we are told. That's it, forget about them. Uh, and importantly, so all these changes that they had to adjust, most importantly and most terrifying, they would renounce their understanding of where they would go in the afterlife. At a time of total belief in the afterlife, the choice they made would determine their eternity. You know, I mean, if you believe, if you're a Christian, Muslim, or Jew, you believe that the others don't make it to where you're going to make it. Now you're changing. I mean, that's a terrifying decision to realize that now I'm going to belong to a group that thinks differently. Was that action an action of courageous self-reflection and scrutiny? of examination and final determination. And the question that I have for us in our discussion, was it or was it not as terrifying this decision to convert, terrifying, bewildering, and tortuous as it was for Hamlet to be or not to be? Third question, what is the role of political geography? We don't know just picking up on what I've said, we don't know the inner workings of the soul. Conversion at the micro level. People, after all, are great liars. But we can know the historical, national factors that drove individuals to conversion. The macro level, if 
you want to call it. And so what the psychological or spiritual reason that motivated conversion may not be easily separated from the larger geographical and political determinants. Again, we have to appeal to the difference between conversion in Christian and conversion in Muslim domain. So again, we come back to these important differences between the, the, the sexual differences between the two religions. Converting in the Christian Mediterranean. Religion was nationality. For the largest part of the population, religion determined who they were, where they were, and in what conditions they lived. There were, of course, cracks in the edifice. There were Catholics in Protestant England, Protestants in Catholic France until expulsion of the Huguenots in 1685, Jews in Catholic Venice or Protestant Amsterdam, Moriscos in Spain until 1609. But really, in Western European ideology, ideology there was no official separation between state and church. And the church was denomination, Catholic or Protestant, and Protestant in its various manifestations. The greatest theoretician of religious toleration uh, in the 17th century was John Locke. But while he was willing, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this very, very famous and kind of foundational text, um, while he was willing to tolerate in principle, Mus uh, in principle he actually says, you know, we can tolerate in the British monarchy, we can tolerate Muslims, we can tolerate Jews, we can tolerate Quakers, you know. In other words, people completely out of range. Not only not Christian, I mean, in the case of Muslim Jews, not Christian, but Quakers, not Anglicans. But, uh, but he was absolutely adamant that toleration should not be extended to Catholics or to atheists because they were a danger to the state. So even the most the profoundest thinker of toleration still had his limitations. In European Christendom, there was no multi-religious or multicultural ideal. You could not gain employment in government, enter university, or join an ecclesiastical institution unless you converted or, you know, behaved as if you had converted. I mean, nobody knows what happens inside. But you had officially to have converted to the denomination and not just the religion of the monarchy. Don't forget that Catholics would not go to universities in England until the 19th century. So it's again the issue of not religion, just religion, but denomination. Again, there were cracks for making a living, but they were very tight cracks. Trade was one option. We find a lot of Huguenots, a lot of Jews, a lot of kind of Moriscos, etc., working within that range. Money exchange, medicine, these were possible areas. But you were not safe. A different religion than the monarchs was both disadvantageous and dangerous. Thus, cuius regio, cuius religio. The religion of the uh, monarch is the religion of the people, of the state. Which took hold in Europe from 1555 on. And I think it continued basically into the 18th century. And this kind of making the dominant religion of the land coincide with the dominant power in the land. In such a context, religion was not a matter of volition and belief, but of obedience and security of domicile. This situation had been long in the making and visually appears in one of the most powerful examples of the association between conversion and political submission. The example is both historical and heuristic, reflecting the past, but also instructing the present at that time. This is the tableau of the uh, cathedral in Granada. Uh, this is the royal chapel downstairs. I'm sure some of you have been there. And I found it fascinating to think about it, because as you stand in front of this, which is where, you know, this is where the altar is, so that's where you receive your sacrament, if you're a Catholic, etc. And what you're looking at is all these, you know, figures of the saints, but at the bottom, that's the same picture I showed earlier. So, you're worshipping Christ, God, etc., but part of your worship of that involves the conversion of the other. And this is, let's say, the forcible conversion of so it's being celebrated in the altar. 
So worship and political identity, worship, and if you want even ethnic identity, are coming together. What's even more fascinating is that, as I say, you stand facing the altar and awaiting the sacrament, and behind you are the two tombs of Ferdinand and Isabella. And of course, and them were the expulsion of the Jews and the, and the uh, Muslims, uh, so they're there behind you. And what's even more fascinating is that on the tomb of uh, Philip, the famous, the famous statue of San Diego. Now this is not what you find there. I just couldn't find a good picture of it. But it is there as an illustration. So I mean, if I were able to take that picture, I would. But this statue, which is a very, very kind of widely prevalent kind of statue, uh, not just you know, in the northern part, in Santiago de Compostela, not just in the, the cathedral, but all around. So you find that in Granada. You know, this is the same chopping off the heads and killing off the moors. So sacrament, national identity, ethnic identity, linguistic identity, cultural identity, as you have converted everybody out of their cultural and historic religion, and behind you are the heroes, uh, saintly heroes, if you want, of that project. Uh, okay. This is a conversion to the religion of the monarch. What is strange is that in the early modern period, again perhaps a sign of the confusions of early modernity, which is what we all like to talk about in terms of early modernity, a similar obedience to the monarch was demanded of converts living under an enemy monarch. In such a situation, conversion became a dangerously subversive. 17th century began the period of conversion. And that's when Catholic missionaries would venture into the East, uh, basically convert Muslims, Eastern Christians, and Jews to, uh, to Christianity. And that's the chapter that I sent you, basically, of that kind of conversion. And also, of course, Protestants would follow suit. They were not as effective. But, and so what's interesting is now that you convert let's say, a Muslim to Christianity in Aleppo. Is there anything? No? If you convert somebody in Aleppo, or somebody in Istanbul, or somebody in, Jer in Jerusalem, what you expect them is not just to change their religion, but to change their political allegiance. And that is, as I say, becomes subversive. In such a situation, conversion becomes a dangerous subversive act. In the 17th century, Britain and France recognized the importance of trying to convert Ottoman subjects for the preservation and advancement of their commercial and diplomatic goals. In 1674, the greatest Arabist in England, uh, Edward Pocock, translated the Book of Common Prayer. And that is this you know, quintessential text of Anglicanism in America as the Episcopalian Church. Uh, and this book was sent, actually, in its poorly translated Arabic and poorly printed Arabic to Aleppo. Izmir and Istanbul, you know, a few copies, but then most of the other copies were to Aleppo. And it was sent there to convert, basically, Muslims, Eastern Christians, the Orthodox, the Jacobites, the historians, and Jews in the Ottoman Empire, in the hope that they would read it and accept the Christianity of England. They came to accept not just Christianity, the Christianity of this of this particular tradition. Uh, and in the process, and one of the prayers that now they're going to be repeating in that process of conversion is a prayer in which they submit to the king, to the monarch of England. Now this is a prayer for the king of England, 1634, by the convert. This is from the book. I'm just translating that. And so, as I say, think of it as you know, you're in Aleppo, the community is Muslim, or indeed Jewish, or Eastern Christian, Orthodox, etc. Now you've converted. It's not just that you have a new faith. Listen to us, Lord, and this is what you're going to be praying every morning. And bless our gracious queen. Our, our gracious queen. And we have a sultan there. We have lots of... But now the queen is Catherine of Braganza. And the king's brother, James. 
and the rest of the sultan's household. The sultan now is King Carlos. You have to, yeah, Sultan Carlos. You know? Look down on our dear Lord. Now this I find extremely fascinating. Mm -hmm. For those of you who know about anything about King Charles II, who's a playboy, or mm -hmm. has an animal women around him, I mean the guy who's wild. Uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit, that he may walk in your path and follow your guidance. Endow him with the heavenly gifts. Grant him long life, health, and ease, that he may always conquer with piety and purity of life. <laughs> I mean, he has a set of palaces built next to Whitehall, each one a compartment with one of his mistresses. And these kind of wander around there. Right? Purity <laughs> of life. But that is what you would have to do now. That's what conversion entails. That's my question is conversion. The prayer which the convert to Calvinism was to profess in the middle of the Ottoman world necessitated his change from an Ottoman subject to an Anglican English one. Remember what James was told in your reading after he was baptized. Now you are an Englishman and a Christian. In that order. First you become an Englishman and then a Christian. Naturalization is conversion. And to be a Christian Anglican, not only do you have to pray this, but you have to take an oath of allegiance to the king, uh, to the British monarch. And this is the first part of the oath. So this is again what the convert would have had to do. I do I truly and sincerely acknowledge, profess, testify, and de declare in my conscience before God and the world that our sovereign, Lord King Charles, is lawful king of this realm and of all other his majesty's realm. And that, and that the Pope. So again, it's not just that you're going to be, you know, in association with this monarch, you're also going to be hostile to other monarchs, other figures within the Christian dominion. Becoming Christian, so this is, as I say, this part of it, it continues, but you can get a sense of it. Becoming Christian meant becoming a subject of the English monarch, not the French or the Spanish or the papal. Conversion was, as historian Tiaz Habib uh, noted, a pseudo-colonial, quote, pseudo-colonial desire to possess the other. But even in the days before colonialism, conversion was a means to an end. When Meredith Hanmer, doctor of divinity, preached at conversion return to Anglican Christianity in London in 1568, Trade between England and the Ottoman East was booming, and it was in favor of the Ottomans, since England had little to export at the time. So Hanmer urged, and I quote, unfortunately I didn't get that for you, let us export our religion to them. Here. And I, we are greedily bent to get the earthly commodities of Africa, Asia, and the hidden treasures of the Far Indies. We should no doubt provoke them out of the said countries to seek after our God and to be ravished with the con conversation and steps of the Christians. So, you know, even before we have a colonial or an imperialist prototype, we have this idea that, you know, we must export, we must, come. and it is, of course, an English form of Christianity. The convert in Hammer's account took the name of William. This is a very interesting uh, sermon because it tells us, you know, how uh, the the, uh, the Turk had been captured in battle, and how then he kind of really became uh, started to admire Christianity, and he wanted to convert. And of course, he had to be catechized. And actually, in at the end of the sermon here, you have the list of questions in Spanish because the guy could speak English. In Spanish, offered to him, and the answers he gave. What do you think of the Trinity? What do you think of the Incarnation? And he's supposed to have given all these answers uh, in order to be accepted. And then, after that, he's given the name of William. The reason important, and the reason, as I say, the emphasis is on this William. This is William. It's not you know, any other. You could not convert in London and expect to live and pray in Rome, or Madrid, or Valletta. In Christendom, to convert meant you joined a specific national church. You will have to undergo a ritual in the church. There will be a sermon, which is what Hammer, Hammer does. He offers a sermon. Uh, there will be Q&A Q about the articles of 
if you're in a Catholic context, it'll be Catholic faith. In a Protestant context, it'll be Protestant faith. Or Orthodox, because also, also have the same thing. And then finally, the baptism. Finally, the sacrament. So after all this, then you're sacrificed, then you're baptized, and then, of course, as in baptism in the Christian tradition, that's when you get your name. That's when he gets his name, William. But the point is, if you're baptized in Rome, you cannot take communion in London. And if you are baptized in Geneva, you cannot take communion in Athens. Remember that the Catholic Spaniard, now we have one Catholic Spaniard, uh, a companion of James, of Ishmael, uh, was treated, you know, the Catholic Spaniards treated the Greek Orthodox, Antonio, in the same manner they treated the Muslim Ishmael. So for them, both of them are out of the fold. Different baptisms meant different ecclesiastical hierarchies. The Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Presbytery, if you're talking about Geneva, the Patriarch, if you're talking about uh, Constantinople, all of whom did not agree with each other and indeed excluded each other from their churches. Again, remember James. When he started going to the dissenting academies. Now, in England, in the, as of the 1660s and on, you know, as I say, non-Anglicans could not go to university. So unless you took the Oath of Allegiance and you accepted the 39 Articles and the Book of Common Prayer, you could not go to university, even if you're a Christian, even if you're a Presbyterian, if you're a Quaker, if you're a Baptist. So what happened is that they established their own kind of quasi-parallel universities, which were called the dissenting academies. And there's a you know, wonderful history of these academies because they're very, very active and very effective, by far more at some point, particularly in the 18th century, by far more effective than the universities. But the whole point is, again, in the narrative we read, uh, James is being excluded, is being looked down on by the, you know, by those to whom he had belonged. I mean, he had converted, but they still kind of don't accept him, don't take him in. So he goes to the dissenting academies. So I think they have their own worship. Obviously, they didn't have the kind of authority that the Anglican Church had, but they had their own worship. And he found that more interesting. He found that more intimate. He found that more helpful. So he started doing that, and then what he stole, you can't go there. Uh, remember, he started going to the sending of where he felt much more welcome. He was told that he converted, he had converted to Christianity. That for the Anglican, that was not really Christianity. And Christianity simply was Anglican. So the whole limitations in terms of conversion within the Christian environment. And, of course, in the case of James, of Ishmael, if you had the wrong skin color, as James had, then even conversion would not ensure you of safety or dignity. So many times, as you remember in the reading, he was abused. His wife nearly compromised, beaten, robbed, because he was a, quote, unquote, a Turk i.e. not English in at least, because Turk can also mean Muslim. But here it was really that you're not a Turk because you have a different pigmentation, you're different, you're, you're darker skin. Even though he had become Anglican, become English, James was merely harassed. So I mean, he had a rough time, but it was merely harassment after he had converted. But converting in the wrong place, to the wrong denomination, could prove deadly. In 1667, the patriarch of the Jacobite church, Jacobite one of the small religious uh, Christian groups in uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, the Jacobite church of Antioch, patriarch Din, converted to Catholicism during his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. His congregation was resentful, so resentful that they poisoned him. <laughs> and as the report state, and this is their report, they actually, quote unquote, killed him. So it was dangerous. So this is the Christian kind of complication, complexity of conversion. And the Islamic environment. Differently, in the Muslim dominions, religious diversity was part of Quranic law. Christians and Jews were protected communities within the lands of Islam, in the Mediterranean, and beyond also in the Safavid Empire, also in the Mughal Empire. That's why the largest Jewish population in the world in the period under study, that was in this period, lived in Muslim lands. 
especially around the shores of the White Sea, the Mediterranean, from Morocco to Anatolia, extended inland into Iraq and, of course, Eastern Europe. And the largest native Christian population outside European Christendom was there as well. Think of the Americas, of course, they're all converted forcibly or not, but these were the native Christians from the beginning of the Christian message. As minorities, Christians and Jews had to pay an extra tax and could not serve in the military, although sometimes they did. But they were full subjects of the ruler and could appeal to Islamic courts for resolving all their civil disagreements, even ecclesiastical squabbles, in a manner that no minority could do in the European Christian environment. For Christians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire, the dominions, the principle of the religion of the subject being the religion of the ruler did not apply. And in principle and in history, they did not have to convert. Of course, and given Islam's conversionary trust, the Ottomans, like Catholics and Protestants, were very eager to convert the unbelievers. But they were obligated by Quranic law to maintain the status of Dhimma for them. Now, Dhimma is a term often heard it means second-class citizens. There's no question. They're a second-class subject. Just as Jews have been treated in the Byzantine Empire and Muslims in the Christian kingdoms of Spain and in the Latin Christian kingdoms of the Crusades. Even so, many historians point to this factor to question Islam's toleration. That the minority of the Islamic dominions did not have the same privileges or opportunities as the Muslim majority and that they were marginalized and sometimes maltreated is not contested. That's obvious. But let us contextualize the Ottoman and Arab Islamic treatment of their minorities. And let us compare and contrast the conditions of minorities with Muslims and under Christian rule or Catholics or Protestants under Protestant or Catholic rule. Christians were not tortured in the Ottoman dominions in the manner that many a Morisco or a Marano, a Muslim or Jew, was in Spain in order to force him to confess to an allegedly hidden religion. No mosque or synagogue remained standing in Iberia, nor were there any mosques in the whole of Western Europe, in the manner that churches and synagogues remained active and were refurbished and restored under Muslim rule, and not just that, but under sultanic authority. This is... Uh, this is a request by the French to kind of rebuild the church. It had been burnt. But what's important here is by permission to build the church, as I say, uh, by the popes. In other words, it's the sultan who's actually giving permission for the rebuilding, refurbishing of that church. They, they only want to make sure that the same size, the same kind of shape, but basically it's the sultan, it's the king, who's authorizing that. There was no persecution of Jesuits. At su and subsequent trial, conviction, hanging, and quartering, as it happened in the England of Queen Elizabeth. Rather, Jesuits and other orders had the golden age of mission in the period under study, as long as they never preached to us. That was, that was again, accepted fact. I'm not pushing, you know, when I say all this, I'm not pushing for the rosy picture of convivence. There were always bouts of violence and abuse by mobs and fanatics. But perhaps one thing to remember, if we take the year 1700, which is the end of our period, how much of religious and cultural history remained of the American Indians after the European Christian conquest and empire? None. The population was nearly totally wiped out. Do we remember, and of course let us remember, that in the United States it was against the law, against, it was illegal for Native Americans to use their language until 1976 and to worship in their traditional manner until 1993. I was shocked as I went to an Indian church maybe three weeks ago, and I learned that then from them. In 1700, so if we go back to that same year, Christian numbers were on the rise in the Ottoman Empire, and there were Christian poets writing in Arabic, Jews translating their accounts, as you saw in the account by Bulos, and Christians building houses in Aleppo with Christian, you know, beautiful Christian, Iconography. This is the famous Aleppo house uh, 
Fortunately, it was stolen by the Germans at the beginning of the 20th century, transported to Berlin. It's in a museum there. I'm sure had it stayed in Aleppo, it might have been destroyed. But this is a Christian house uh, and with Christian motifs here. What fascinated me about it is that they have all you know, saints and you know, reflecting stories of Jesus and all the rest of it. The one thing that was not there was crucifixion, which of course is not acceptable in the Quran. Uh, and all this is being done in the Islamic Empire, in the heart of the Islamic Empire. As one famous historian has said, Alistair Hamilton has said, quote, from the Turks, i.e. the Muslims, the Eastern Christians and the Jews had no inquisition to fear. End of quote. Furthermore, in the Ottoman Empire in Morocco, conversion was not combined regionally or denomination, and therefore not geographically limited. It opened three continents, from Fez to Aleppo to Baghdad to Sarajevo, and therefore travel, settlement, marriage, employment. You could convert in Morocco and pray in Jerusalem, or Baghdad, or Mecca. The differences in ritual were minimal, as long as you belonged to the vast majority of the Muslim population, which was Sunni. When converts became believers, Muslims did not necessarily naturalize into Moroccans or Syrians. They became Muslim. And from Meknas in Morocco uh, to Aleppo, they would see the same Quranic verses, different calligraphies, of course, as they would see in Jerusalem or Istanbul, in a manner that a Muslim convert to Anglicanism or Calvinism or Catholicism or Orthodoxy would see sharply different church interiors. Hear different liturgical languages. Listen to sermons with different convolutions of theology and seek salvation from different ecclesiastical authorities. As we said, the Pope, the Patriarch, the Presbytery, etc. What would Bulus have understood of his new faith? Bulus converted to Catholicism, perfectly happy in that, if he had gone into an Amsterdam Calvinist church with its totally bare walls, or into Ely Cathedral in England, just near Cambridge, where... What do you see about this? They uh, defaced a lot of the statues during the... Mm. Okay, so what... You know, he had converted to Catholicism, which is highly visual, and he would go and see that. How would he have thought of this? No wonder that in many, many North African writings about the Protestant Catholic kind of conflict in Europe, they simply thought these were two separate religions. They couldn't figure out that this was, you know, one religion kind of contesting itself against another. You know, they'd always say these are two different religions. So, conversion to Christianity had a macro context, social political, and ecclesiastical. But interestingly, our texts show the psychology of faith, the micro level. Or do they? And so that's another question I have for you for our discussion. Is the micro level compatible with the macro level as the converts tell their narratives? Both James and Bulos assert that the reason they converted was because they found something attractive, desirable about Christianity. Somehow they were not satisfied with their old religion. They described their conversion as a decision for transformation. Was it a decision for transformation? Was the issue of their identity separate from, or was it rooted in the larger map of Mediterranean religious rivalry? How much can we trust their words about desiring another religion when, let's face it, they knew very little or nothing about that religion? Right. Question number four is how were they converted and the whole issue of proselytization. Again, Christianity and are two very different mechanisms. So, how did you convert to Christianity? The Euro Christian churches developed institutions and organizations for proselytization, the like of which neither the Ottoman, nor the Mughal, nor the Persian administrations ever developed. From Rome to Paris to London to Venice, to Naples, to Valletta, there were systematic, well-organized, choreographed campaigns by ecclesiastical institutions to convert Muslims and Jews and Eastern Christians. The missionary effort was integrated into the epistemology of European education, scholarship, print, and empire. And the effort was run by an organization, 
because an organization can make possible and consolidate religious belonging. It's not a coincidence that the major powers that invested in trade in the Islamic Mediterranean were also the first countries to build institutions for the study of Arabic and Islam and to send missionaries to France and Holland, Venice and Rome and England. In Catholic Europe, there were numerous Casa de Catechumeni and institutes like the Domus Conversorum, as in medieval England for the Jews. But the most powerful and enduring expression is the 1622 establishment of the Sacred Congregation for, for the Propagation of the Faith, the Propaganda Fide, now known as the Congregation for the Evangelization of People. In that organization, numerous methodologies were developed for disputation and translation, along with linguistic, philological studies and scriptural and textual exegesis. All these were coordinated by church officials and text paid for by monarchs and merchants, Catholics and Protestants alike. Protestants later, but nevertheless. Who in the 16th, 17th century violently tried to convert each other as they fought horrific wars of religion on the continent. All these viewed the conversion of Muslims, along with Eastern Christians and Jews, as part of their ongoing conflict. That's why they all started the Catholics much better and earlier than the Protestants, treating the missionary effort as a new era, as a new area of research, a systematic project worth all the money spent on purchasing manuscripts of, of history, theology and polemic, educating priests, printing new editions of the scriptures, I've seen one over there, 1590, including the first illustrated Arabic version of the New Testament, the one that we were just showed in the morning, and, finding and funding university chairs in Oriental languages, Arabic, Syrian, Hebrew, Ethiopic, and others. With the flush of gold and silver from the exploitation of the new world, there was ample funding. Nothing shows the institutional nature of the early modern conversion effort than the tome prepared by Philippe Guadagnoli. And this, to me, is the supreme example. In 16, initially it was written in Latin in 1631, and then translated into Arabic in 1637. In Latin, the Apologia uh, Pro Christiana Religione is 557 quarto pages. In Arabic, it's 1,110 quarto pages. I actually, that's the reason I brought my, this is the, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Now, I actually wanted to, this is you know, obviously a reproduction, <laughs> and so I actually wanted to see the book itself. And I happened to be in Berlin conference and went to the, and it's very, very rare. And so and they were confused why I wanted the picture of the book. This is the book. Uh, asked by the Pope to write a refutation of Islam in order to convert the Muslims of the Arabic speaking world. Guadagnoli, who's uh, Friar Minor, um, began work in 1625. The book shows the power of the institution. Guadagnoli had a massive library at his command of Arabic, Greek, Syriac, Persian, and Hebrew manuscripts. And by the way, he knew all these languages. Further, the institution made possible the printing of the book at a time when Arabic typesets, and that's what I was talking uh, earlier to Matt there, is that the Catholics developed better, by far better types of, than the Protestants. So, you know, you look at the New Testament, it's lovely to look at. The quality of the Arabic is poor, but at least it looks very elegant to look at. <laughs> Unlike, the, as I say, the Protestant material that were published later. Further, the institution made possible the printing. And the institution facilitated the distribution of the book by means of contacts made with Arabic speakers in the East. This is what it is. The book was uh, printed by Yusuf some guy named Joseph, from Mount Lebanon. Um, in, now, I don't know what this Mukli in Romania, it kind of some village uh, in the year 11, uh, 1637. Uh, so, I mean, there's this network, the organizational network that makes possible printing, research, you know, to produce this huge book. And it covers every possible angle you can imagine. The book is exhaustive. Every possible principle in Islam is refuted by erudite references to Muslim scholars. This guy had access to Muslim uh, 
to Muslim manuscripts, Avicenna, uh, Averroes, uh, Bukhari, amazing range of knowledge that the that the, that Guadagnoli had, and it is a book which actually I think of it more as a nightmare that could only be written, translated, printed, and distributed by means of a worldwide, highly efficient, wealthy, and organized institution, the propaganda media. So this is what I can see within the Christian experience of propaganda. It was institutionalized. It was supported by money, supported by monarchs, supported by merchants. And therefore, there was a structure into which everybody could work. The linguist, the philologist, the translator, the collector, the buyer of manuscripts, etc. Everybody kind of poured into one institution that could produce that kind of scholarship. It is terrifying, you know. To Islam. Both the Ottoman Empire and Morocco, and I always kind of draw a difference because Morocco never came under the Ottoman. And you can say the Safafid and the Mughals, although I don't touch on them, lacked the mosque and government sponsored institution that convert non-Muslim. They didn't have anything like that. From Meknes in Morocco to Istanbul, there was nothing in the Muslim centers of authority that functioned as an Islamic financial cum ideological leadership at, that promoted and implemented conversion of Christians or Jews in the manner that Louis XIII, Louis XIV, Pope Gregory XV, and earlier, of course, Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu, British emissaries and factors, and others did of Muslims and Eastern Christians and Jews. Although Islam was propagated into Sub-Saharan Africa and as far as the Spice Island, Indonesia, by Sufi orders, there were no orders similar to the highly organized and ideologically strident and financially solid Dominican and Franciscans and Jesuits, the often known as the shock troops for converting Jews and Muslims and Mongols and Native Americans. Nowhere in Islamic governments were there budgets, officials, officers, and scholars who were paid to proselytize Christians and Jews? Nor were there handbooks of disputation or printed tomes. Actually, they didn't even have printing until the beginning of the 18th century. Similar to those that assisted French and Italian and English missionaries in preaching Christianity in the Arabic-speaking world. Nor did Muslim religious authorities send sheikhs to preach in Paris or London or Madrid or subsidize the building of mosques in European cities in the manner that chapels and churches were built and or restored, as we saw earlier, in North African and Middle Eastern cities with European money. Nor were there zealous Muslims, like those Quakers who went to preach, desiring other, either converts or martyrs, and meeting with neither after they were thrown out by concerned compatriots. An example is the English consul in Marseille in April 1658, reported hearing from Sir Smyrna, Izmir, that in February, and I quote, six Quakers arrived, three men and three women, who pretend to go to convert the grand senior. They wanted to convert the sultan. But the consul at Smyrna hindered them. So they are gone to Venice, pretending to convert the Jews. And as is evident in the Christian disputations with the Jews, the ones that, you know, in my chat, they are long because of the biblical and the exegetical scholarship that was included in them. Behind them, there was a whole canon of knowledge that was prepared and designed for the purpose of intellectual and theological argument. As Voulos stated, the, convert, the Jewish convert, he spent eight months learning what it was to be and become a Christian. And so did Ishmael, albeit from different uh, Christian tradition. Admittedly, the Protestants were in no way as prepared for the prospect of converting others as the Catholics. In their total stupidity, they offered him, they offered Ishmael, as you remember in your reading, a book to study Christianity that had been prepared for converting Indians. Think of James. What book was he given to learn, uh, to read about Christianity? Which was a book uh, by Bishop Wilson, kind of 1730s. But by the end of our period, the English would begin to build an institution like the Catholic Propaganda Feeding the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge in 1698, which, like the propaganda, still functions today. These two institutions, with varying degrees, had money, power, royal support, papal planning, in the case of the Catholic, printing presses, linguists, scholars, theologians, all united in the project of winning converts to Christianity. Nothing, nothing like this was present 
the Islamic world. Of course, Muslims desired that non-believers be guided to God, but they never turned that desire into a state or mosque-sponsored project. Take the example of Osman, the one we have in our reading, an intriguing enigma to his correspondence even until today. Why and how did he convert? Micro or macro motivations or pressures? What we know about him, he was born in 1573 and died in 1637. The only information about him survives in around 80 letters he exchanged with Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Claude Fabrizio Peresque, that's the picture, but that's not him, and another, uh, another figure by the name of Ayat. He was an old man when he was captured. This is Thomas Arco, who became Osman. He was an old man when he was captured, and thus one assumes grounded in his faith. He was captured to Tunis sometime around 1629 to 1630. In his first surviving letter of April 1630, he described his condition. But a couple of months later, June, he wrote that he had freed himself from captivity, perhaps paid off his ransom. But as he continued in that letter, he and his master had become good friends. His master had been so kind to him that he decided to stay in Tunis for five or six months more, becoming before returning to France. In a letter of March 1631, he explained that he was still in Tunis because he had not found a ship to hold him back. But then, by November 1632, he had converted to Islam. And as one letter reported about him, and he had moved to a big house and was receiving a, a handsome pension from his ruler. Why did he convert? Did he sell his soul for a house and a pension? Or was it that life was nicer in Tunis because he could lord it over the, as he called them, the barbarian, whom he frequently denounced in his letters. Better be somebody in Tunis than nobody in Paris. Is it true, as he explained in the letter we read, a couple of letters I translated for you, that he had converted externally, but remained a Christian internally? That the excision, circumcision, because that's what it would entail if you convert as a male to be circumcised, was just a bodily matter that had no impact on his soul, that his baptism as a child could wash away his, as he described it, his condition, his condition. He never actually uses the word apostasy or anything else. And how good a Muslim did he become when he asked Perez to send him barrels of wine to share with his former patron? Or did he grow to admire Muslims and their way of life in the manner that James grew to admire Christians, Ishmael, and their way of life. Or was it simply adaptation? Did Darko adapt to Islam and so convert? In the period under study, he could live as a Christian. Things might be good or bad, depending on the whim of the ruler, but in principle, there was a place for him in the social hierarchy of Tunis. After years, he could not but adapt to a new way of life, new rhythm of the day, new weekdays, new holidays, new calendar. He would start dressing in the more comfortable and airy clothes of the North Africans. Did Darko shed his hat in favor of a head cover that was more effective, more effective in warding off the Sirocco? He still missed his wine and cheese, but he could find ways to get them. And actually, often in his letters mentioned that he wanted French cheese. Osman used two names to do different correspondence. To Perez who's kind of an important figure, he signed his name Thomas Darko. Uh, to Ayad, the other kind of recipient of his correspondence, it was Osman Darko. Who was this man? Why did he convert? What does Osman Thomas Darko tell us about the intersection of the macro and the micro levels of conversion? I mean, getting there. Fifth question started the paper, the title was Silent War. Final question, who won the war? I started with the question. The answer is, well, we don't know. Whether there were more Christians who converted than Muslims, or Muslims than Christians, it's impossible to determine. And so beware, and that's kind of for you to tell your students, about beware of numbers and generalizations, unless they can be supported by names. In their magnificent study of conversion, Lucille and Bartholomew uh, 
and I started and I have the book here if anybody wants to look at it, uh, went through the colossal French archive and counted those and counted names. Basically, listen. The result was this list. It's just one of the pages. There are three pages uh, of, of names. But at least we have names. Multiply. So as I say, we have some kind of base to work with. Multiply it by five times, ten times, fifty times, to make up for the lost names. I'm sure they didn't get all of them. So lots of converted and never kind of, we don't know anything about it. But at least you get an idea about what kind of framework we're working with. Although still, it will always remain tenuous. It will always remain problematic. So beware of throwing out figures haphazardly. Many historians actually, you know, to make a case, extrapolate without counting or by relying on one set of records to represent all records. And they often do that for either ideological or publishing reasons. Gets the book going. If you want to make a statement about how many converts or captives or reconverts, you know, anything that you want to do in in particular these very sensitive areas of his uh, look at names, count them, and then be specific in proposing your thesis about their name, numbers. Twenty years after the Ben Sars, I did the same. I mean, I'm crazy, so I do the same thing. In order to establish how many Britons were taken captive into North Africa in the early month period, I spent ten summers running, running around the English archive for names. Names for me, are precise and help you make credible generalizations in numbers. I have my book here if you want to look at the names. It's kind of basically half the book are the names. Events. So names are fundamental to any kind of theory that we need or we want to make about the element period. But even so, even my listing names, there will still be difficulties. How about charlatans? Was Ishmael a charlatan? Do you believe him as a devout convert to Christianity? How about Osman, with his claim to the difference between inner, I'm still inner, I'm still Christian inside, but externally Muslim outside. Uh, an excuse, by the way, that appears in many other writings. You find it in many other converts who wrote, both Christian and Muslim. Muhammad Bey, here is you know, history of imposters, visited England, this is the second one, visited England in the 1660s and was welcomed by King Charles as a convert from Islam and a warrior for Christianity in Central Europe. He was feted and celebrated until he was overheard a few weeks later in a pub, ordering a pint of ale in his native cockney. <laughs> <laughs> or how about deconverts and reconverts? Many men and women converted, but then reconverted. In the majority of cases, after returning to their homes. You can do that only if you return to your basic home. You can't reconvert, otherwise you pay the price. Some paid with their lives if they reconverted in the country of their new religion. Many Muslims and Jews were burned in autos de fe in Spain. Many Christians were executed when they decided to renounce Islam and return to Christianity in Muslim dominion. But the larger number of returning reconverts were welcomed back into the home form. The Inquisition records are full of examples of interrogation in order to ascertain, and they wanted to ascertain, they just kind of, you know, wanted to turn a blind eye to the fact that the conversion had been fake and that the returnee was truly genuine about his desire to re-embrace Christianity. I think the most extreme case I've found is with the English returnees. They return from captivity and nobody knows if they convert or not. Are they Muslim or Christian? And then, you know, from the village, they were captured at sea, they returned. And so there's one sermon in which the preacher says to the, to the congregation, you know, follow the, follow the, the man into the privy, to the battery, <laughs> oh. spy on him, see whether he had been circumcised or not. That was, say, the extreme case of trying to verify. But in most cases, they were just willing to accept them. There were actually rituals of readmission, both in the Catholic and the Protestant tradition. Meanwhile, in Islam, enough was to repeat the witness to God and his prophet, to be rejoined to your co-religionists. Or how about hybrids and syncretists? Were there men and women who, according to Brodel, were half Christians, half Muslims, living on the borders of two worlds? Unfortunately, we don't have writings 
by them. We have writings about them, and that's kind of always problematic for me. But writings by such people describing the complexity of their self-understanding. Could there be hybridity in religion? And so, back to the three conflicts. How would you categorize them? Are they half half? Ishmael, J, uh, Boulos, Musa. Consider the story from Egypt, with which I'll be ending, reported at the end of the 17th century. And I summarized it. It's in a Moroccan book at the kind of end of the 18th century, but it looks back at the 17th century. Sheikh Yahya al Mahdisi, uh, translate his name, John of, of Jerusalem, was a Christian from Crete who was an authority on Christian scripture. That's the story that we're actually told by the man himself in that, in that uh, narrative. When he started showing interest in Judaism and debating with Jewish scholars, he was shunned by his Christian community. And after 10 years of serving as a judge among the Christian community, he was dismissed from office. Furious, he left for Jerusalem, where he converted to Judaism, which he so mastered that he became a judge and served for seven years. Meanwhile, he was reading Arabic Islamic books and debating with Muslims. The Jews grew angry and dismissed him. Furious, he left Jerusalem to Anatolia, the land of the room, as he calls it, where he converted to Islam and commuted between Islam, Istanbul, Adana, and Bursa to perfect his studies. He became a judge, I quote, in a small town called Ankara. Kind of interesting. He went twice on the pilgrims to Mecca and Medina, after which he settled in Cairo and taught at the Azhar for years. When he tried to become chief judge, Fellow scholars grew jealous of him and divulged the secrets about his life to the prince who banished him to Alexandria. Furious, he renounced teaching and began denouncing princes, rulers, and judges, even cursing them openly while continuing in prayer and fasting. How would you categorize this? I hope we can agree that conversion and the study of conversion are very complicated subjects. But by focusing on the first person narratives or converts, we can categorize conversion as an important marker of early modernity. Voluntary conversion was a choice, a choice often dangerous, that began to be made in the period under study in a manner that had not occurred before in the Mediterranean. As James, Ishmael, and Osman, Thomas Larko, and Boulos, with Musa, showed us, conversion was a process that entailed volition. And so, is the conflict in his deliberation and ambivalence and total self-transformation, in his self-fashioning, to use a famous phrase by Stephen Greenberg, in his self, is he as much of a marker of early modernity as figures such as perhaps the most famous convert, Al-Hassan al-Wazan. And I have his book here, if you want. This is a novel about him, it's a wonderful novel, Highly historically based, but still a novel. But anyway, mm. this is, he was kind of born in Granada, raised in, fled with the expulsion in, into Morocco, traveled all around North Africa, into Central Africa, finally is captured and taken to Rome, converts to Christianity, become, writes actually his account about North Africa in Italian. Uh, and then in 1527, when Rome is in, you know, invaded, is attacked, he flees, and that's the end we hear about. Muslim historians like to think he returned to Tunis and returned to his Christianity. Maybe, maybe not. But the whole point is, again, this is perhaps the most famous story of conversion. Is he, is Hamlet, <coughs> is Don Quixote, is Candide, these are all figures of instability, of change, of doubt, of confusion, of search. Are they, like the conflict, models of modernity? Given that social relationships played no role in conversion or political pressure. We don't see that they're being forced. And they say, that's why I left kind of forcible conversion. Seeing we don't see that, at least in our cases, should our <coughs> three converts be viewed as models of individuation, as really the early modern individual, in the same way the Tantra of Kanitia. As one historian wrote, conversion was, and I quote, one of early modern Europe's most pressing religious issues. End of quote. Which is why it should be studied carefully. Today, conversion continues to be pressing, unfortunately, turning religion into a disruptive factor 
in the political and social spheres. Which is why the warning by Pope Francis is both beautiful and timely. Never take proselytizing attitude. Never. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, would you entertain some questions? Absolutely. Uh, a few of this, I, I know you're tired at yeah, this right. point, but uh, if folks have something that they would like to immediately bring up, or would you like to prefer? Would you prefer no, 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 no that's fine. Well, I mean, as I say, we're going to discuss other questions later, but I'd love to hear his question because, as I say, this is a chapter which I know is very endorsed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I had a question. So going back to, you kind of framed this as you have the Paul, St. Paul's experience and, and Augustine's experience, and then that's not reflected. And I was, I was thinking specifically about St. Augustine, how you could you could almost see that as a conversion in, in the Islamic sense of a return to what was sort of originally there in his childhood through his mother. Um, and, and the reason I thought, I, I recently read... Um, uh, William James varieties of religious experience oh, okay. and, and the focus there is on the conversion experience within a faith tradition so someone who's strayed and then converts back um, and my impression was the sort of you know Damascene struck by lightning type experience was far more common for the people who were not going from one faith tradition to another but who sort of viewed their return to a faith it mm -hmm. through the and I was wondering if that if, if um, in the early modern period, if people sort of returning to their own faith without crossing a line into a different faith, like do they talk about their experience as conversion, or is that? I mean, that's the problem. We don't have a lot of writings by converts, which is what I really want to focus on, which is what the reading uh -huh. are about. Uh, in the case of Muslims converting to Christianity, it's more that they've seen a different, a better, a more, uh, more convincing interpretation mm -hmm. of the relationship with, with God. In the Christian sense, uh, in the Christian text I've seen, when they write about it, they write about it after they have returned home. Mm -hmm. And so it's problematic because basically they're writing to an audience that's going to buy their book. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to tell them that we really kind of converted out of conviction. So they're always going, just like Darko is external and internal, you find it in many other writings. That you know this is just external, but deep down I'm still a Christian. So they they always draw that difference between external and internal, which you don't find in the Islamic context at all. Jewish figures, as I say, very rarely have I found. I mean, the disputations, all the materials I've been looking at, because I'm looking at it from their own language. I want to see what they said as they spoke the language, and you know, and there I can't find more than I mean I haven't found anything else yet more than Bolus. And then you see that you know, he sees himself as moving into a completely different experience. Coming back to your uh, you know, analogy with Augustine, that's, that's very interesting. It's just that in the, in the Christian, uh, in the Islamic Quranic tradition, I mean, this is, your, this is your inherent human condition, that you are born in obedience to God. That's how you are. With the Augustinian example, yes, his mother and the influence, and I'm sure it, it must have played a role. I mean, he writes that this was the moment of his conversion, you know. Uh, but I'm sure there was a process. But, uh, but it's not like going back to actual, but being human means, which is what it means in Islam, that you're actually going back to being human in submission to God. That's what it means. I think that would be quite a difference. Yeah. But it's, it's a good point. But yeah, I, I would see that as a process. I yeah. mean, there's no question that, you know, as Mumsy and their tears, etc., I mean, they, they must have played their role. And, yeah. and I guess the follow up question is like, in, so in the early modern experience, the modern <coughs> period, does somebody who, um, you know, has maybe just drifted into a dissolute and irreligious lifestyle, when they return <coughs> to a, a more strict practice of faith, do, do people describe that as conversion or? Uh, the one example I have, actually I have an article about that, is uh, a member of the Druze faith, uh, who at the beginning of the 18th century, and that's a unique text as well, but again, but it wasn't written by him, just like it's my, it's written by somebody, I mean, it's, it's in Arabic, and it's written probably by a priest, because it's very learned in terms of the theology, but what he tells us is that he grew up in this village of Bailan in Syria, and uh, he 
like you said, he drifted into sin and iniquity, spent all his money, etc. And then he met, you know, he started traveling around the world. I don't know. But he went into Western, Western Europe and met an Englishman, a Roman, Roman meaning Catholic, but Roman Catholic, and the Frenchman. And that they all, all three gave him their teach, I mean, the teachings of their faith. And he chose the Roman, the, the Catholic. And so he converts there. So we have an account uh, of him telling us a story, just like uh, Musa uh, Bulus, the Jewish guy. We have an account like telling us the, the kind of transition, the movement from being a Druze to that. What is fascinating about him is that he actually goes back. And because he's a Druze, uh, the Ottoman authorities are really, I mean, he's, you know, he's already a heretic anyway, so who cares about him? So he's not persecuted. You know, had he been a Sunni Muslim, he would, yeah. he would have survived. But a Druze, who cares, you know? And so he actually goes, and the rest of it is uh, a kind of a, a dialogue he's having disputation with the, you know, the leaders of his community. And he has actually a Christian priest, a Catholic Christian priest with him to help him in the argument. Uh, they don't convert, but I think, as I say, it was written at the beginning of the 18th century. It's definitely coming from a French background. And the French always had this lovely idea that one of the Druze rulers of Lebanon, at the early beginning of the 17th century, Fakhreddin, had actually converted to Christianity. So I think they wanted this as an example to show him that you know, there is a possibility of that conversion among the Druze. Because they could operate among the Druze, they could operate among <coughs> other, I mean, among the Sunni Muslims in that respect. But as I say, I mean, that's the challenge of finding these texts. Because the convert you know, doesn't write, particularly the, in, the, in the Arabic tradition, because you, you know, in, the, in the European tradition, you can sell your text. You know, you write your account, and then you sell it, you make money. In the Arabic tradition, there's no printing press, so there's no reason to write that. Uh, the other text I found, for instance, is about actually an Egyptian imam who is captured and ends up in Rome. Again, it's the beginning of the 18th century. And he tells us that he was impressed by the way Christians lived in Rome, which I can't imagine is a very chaste place at the beginning of the 18th century, but in a sense he says that's what kind of got him drawn to the religion and he converts to that. Um, these are at least accounts now I can think of which are in Arabic and therefore in their own voice. I mean, to a large, as, as far as possible. It's, it's not about conversion, but um, related to Matt's question, it was uh, also really easy, and it was a daily occurrence to lose your status as a Muslim. And if you, you know, like commit a sin, or if you say something that you are not supposed to say about God, or authorities, or prophet, I'm talking about Tejdi, the Iman, and Nikah, sure, like yeah. renewal of faith and marriage. And it's not conversion, but it's also interesting in that sense how the authorities view uh, of you know like someone's belief or someone's commitment to a belief because you are basically returning to the faith like by the approval of the authorities mm -hmm. they kind of you need to renew your belonging to the community uh, and that's also an interesting case in the sense that because uh, you lose it but it's also really easy to you know like return to the yeah, community yeah. in that sense the return I renew your faith and yeah. marriage yeah now that I agree I found that as I say, not in the Ottoman text, I don't work with Ottoman material, but definitely in North African uh, Nawazal, uh, jurisprudential decision, Fatawi. Mm -hmm. And you find that frequently that somebody came back from Al Asr, from captivity. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows what's going on? It's been five years, ten years, etc. And, you know, it's coming back, who knows what's happened to his wife, etc. So basically, yeah, it just takes one witness, one statement of witness to, re to be reintegrated. And that, I think, is fundamentally important, that the difference is so dramatic. Because here, you know, you never lose it. Uh, it's always there. You, this is what being human is, is to submit to God. So you may have forgotten it, but it's not. And forgetfulness is not sin. This is what, again, is so important in the difference. Sin is an act of will. You decide to break. You decide to convert, you know. And that's a sin, if you're looking at it from a Christian mm -hmm. perspective. There, it's forgetfulness. It, it, also, it also, I think, also um, 
applies to like really kind of like basic, you know, like sins, just drinking wine or, you know, like saying something about God. And those are also instances of forgetting about God. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Or, you know, like, yeah. And then you still need to, yeah. you know, like renew your faith yeah. and that's renew true. your marriage because yeah. no, that's it's also a yeah, yeah. violation of your status yeah. as a Muslim. I, I would agree. Yeah, yeah that's true. The fundamental difference again that I would like to emphasize that that Professor Matar is on the line uh, in, between the Christian and, and the Muslim case is quite clear. We have the same cases in Western Europe in which uh, simple blasphemy, one word, will get you on the wrong side mm -hmm. of the authorities. Mm -hmm. So you have to meet with authorities most frequently in the Inquisition. And we have actually a pretty good collection here at the Inquisition down. Uh, precisely such cases of blasphemy. Uh, there's lots of institutions, uh, I know the Venetian cases in which you will, you will be called the whole institution, uh, you will be examined, you say, oh, I'm sorry about this, but then you will have to undergo a certain process of, okay, you have to recite X amount of text that specifically refer to that specific sin, so that continues, that remains, it kind of seeps in and prevents further lapsing. Whatever, whereas, most as Professor Matan says, and, and Islam says, okay, I was wrong, you know, I, I figured out, I, I remembered the right way. In Christianity, we will require a process that may last for years of you repeating the proper thing, even if you're just admitting that you're a parish priest, and the parish priest tells you from now on, the next two years, you will recite this and this X amount of times, so it sips in and don't lapse again. So that's a, the difference yeah. between remembering and having a cultural program. One is inherently organic, I would say ontological, mm -hmm. the other is, is cultural. I mean, yeah, that still is the same. I mean, as I said earlier, I kind of watched three, you know, my family watched people who've converted into the three religions. So I've seen it happening. I mean, the Muslim just we go there, and, you know, I'm always an observer. And it's just one statement. It's got two witnesses, and they see you saying that. That's it, end of story. You, 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 end, you enter the room, and in five minutes, you leave it, you're a different person. With the Christian, chiefly Catholic and Protestant, I haven't been to uh, Orthodox, folks, you see. Uh, there's education. You know, they go to church and then they leave. You, you know, during the sermon and during, uh, during the, the Eucharist, and that's where they're getting instructed. And that's kind of for weeks and whatever. In Judaism, it's even longer. I mean, my friend, kind of, it was much longer than that. And uh, but the same idea that you have to learn, you have to, you have to be educated. And there, it's even more because you're getting into a, a kind of an identity of an ethnicity that goes beyond Christianity. So yeah, it is. Uh, you know, each, and that's why I said earlier, you know, when we speak about conversion, they're so different in terms of what they entail. I mean, ultimately, you're joining another community. What does that entail? And what does it take to join that community? Yeah, I was, I was kind of surprised that it took so long for them to accept the conversion, um, and they're telling them to be patient and all these things. I wonder if you know of other converts that were made to wait that long, because it almost seemed like they didn't want him to be converted because they're just putting him off and saying, okay, we'll do, you know, do all this, not now, you know, go to do, you know. It seemed like the process was extremely long, okay. but I wonder if it was solely because it was Muslim, like a Muslim convert or a Turk or whatever, okay. and how that related to maybe other converts in England at the time, like if they did that with everyone, or if they just did that with him because they were suspicious that maybe he wasn't going to be a true convert or whatever. Okay, uh, that's two questions. Mm -hmm. If you're talking from Catholic to Protestant, because we're talking about England, you yes. have to convert into Protestantism. Uh, to convert into Protestantism, you have to take the oath of allegiance and accept the uh, the, uh, the, the, the book of common prayer. Mm -hmm. That's it. So if you're a Catholic, as did happen, of course, uh, you know, various points in time, uh, that's what would be the test. For the Muslims, as I say, this is the first text I know of that describes this conversion, at least supposedly through his own voice. But the whole issue is that you have to be educated. And I've been looking at a huge number of pamphlets mm -hmm. that were published, I don't, I'm ignoring the English material, but they were published in Hull in Germany, uh, in Arabic, to be sent, and they're saying that they published like thousands and thousands, which they sent out at the beginning of the 18th century to Christian Muslims and Eastern Christians. Now, in theory, they shouldn't be sending them to Muslims, but on the title page in Latin, it would say to Muslims, in the Arabic, it wouldn't mention that. Uh, and the point is, which I find absolutely 
incomprehensible. I mean, I understand it, but it's, it's that, you know, you start the treaties, so here you are, you're, you know, you're in Eastern, you're an Orthodox sitting in Aleppo or Jerusalem. And you get this treaties, and you open it, and it starts with quotations from the Bible. It just goes down, quotation after quotation after quotation. What do you make of that? Uh, others will have the Q&A. Who is God? Well, I mean, if you're a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, you know who is God. What does the word Amen mean? Well, all three use it. I mean, but the whole point is that we need to catechize you. We need to instruct you. And so uh, the implication of that, and then others would mention that, you know, the pater familia is going to explain to you, which doesn't make sense. Where is your pater familia in, in Jerusalem explaining to you the rules of Protestant Lutheran Christianity, but the, what underlies it all is that you're going to have to spend time, and that's what it is, time and instruction. You have to learn all these things. And I just, only a few days ago, I got one copy which I requested, uh, which was again part of this whole body of material that was being published in the uh, 18th century, basically 1720s and 1730s. And it's, the, it's called the, 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 the sacred history. And again, couldn't figure out who would make sense of it. It's, it's the sacred history based on the biblical tradition. So half of it is Jewish history, which, but from a Christian perspective. Obviously, all these prophets pointing to Advent of Christ. How would, you know, an, an Orthodox a Jew, even a Muslim, because again, it says Muslim, what would they, what, how could they make sense of it? I mean, the, the names are unfamiliar. They don't belong to their traditions anywhere. How would they make sense of what is the impact? And then half of it from the other half is basically the Christian advent. So implication is, yes, you're going to spend time in order to accept that. And I wish I could find material by individual describing their reaction to that. Uh, I haven't. But I found, for instance, a treatise by the Patriarch of Aleppo in 1671, in which he, he reacts to the Protestant missions. And so he lists all their points and refutes them, which means that they were presenting to their potential converts, uh, you know, lists of things. This is what you have to believe, this is what you have to, and this is what you have to do, this is what you don't have to do. And so you don't have to go on pilgrimage. You don't have to kind of bow before the icon, which was horrendously dis disruptive to the culture of orthodoxy, which is iconic color, you know, etc. So <coughs> that's where I would realize that you know it's a process. They're kind of at, at installments, basically. You have to learn to do this, 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 and then you will be accepted. Now, as I say, that treatise is kind of simply refuting all of them, but he lists twenty uh, entries in which he says, you know, this is what they tell us to do, it's wrong. And he kind of brings his own evidence and argues why it shouldn't be. And the interesting thing is what Kirill uh, was saying is that it's also a matter of culture. You know, I mean, they were totally unaware of the culture. This is a culture of color, this is a culture of icons, this is a culture, you know, people kind of touch the icon, go under the icon, etc. And suddenly they're saying, you know, all this is, is pagan. I mean, come on. And of course, Supposing you accept that, after all this education and instruction, you're going to be solitary. You know, you're no longer part of the community. And we're at the time where your identity is not, you know, you're not Ottoman. You are Orthodox. You are Jewish. You are Muslim. I mean, these are the millets. These are the, the religious groups that are accepted by the Ottoman authorities. So your identity is a religious identity. If you're taken out of the milla, you're taken out of that denomination, where do you go? There isn't any other middle. I mean, the Protestant, and, and these are all Protestants trying to do that. Uh, I mean, that will be accepted in 1850. But so if you're in 1670, what would happen to you? You'd be completely on your own. And there is no Calvinist kind of community. And, you know, uh, I was just reading letters by an Aleppo who went to Europe and corresponded with some of the major uh, orientalists, and uh, spent a number, I mean, 1640s. I mean, the first letter is 1641, last letter is 1650. And Portis is unhappy, he didn't like it. 
I mean, you know, he's always saying, you know, what is it to be here where you don't have your language, you don't have your community, etc. He was basically trying to buy and sell manuscripts, so, you know. But in a sense, what they're being ex expected to do is kind of leave their community. And if they leave it in Damascus or Jerusalem or Aleppo or, or Istanbul, I mean, where would they go? They'd have to go west, just like we saw with, uh, with Ishmael. Are they happy? At least the first account we have by Ishmael Jain. I mean, he was beaten up, he was compromised. I mean, it, it wasn't an easy thing. We don't know what happened after that. I mean, he, he dictated that, we're told, to make some money. So it's still uncertain. So even if you convert, even you say everything, where does it take you? Do you have a question? Because we can wrap it up with this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I have a question about the. Um, Converts to Muslim uh, Islam. So we know from the Ottoman Empire that Jewish converts to Islam began to obtain very high positions at the Ottoman court. For example, they became um, head physicians. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were also despised by the other Ottoman scholars as well. They, they are saying that, oh, they don't know the stuff very well because they were not born as Muslim. So I wonder if you encounter any similar um, discourses from the European sources, like who, um, in which they are talking about um, Muslim converts to Christianity in the same way, or uh, and did they also obtain similar high positions? Uh, That's a good point. Uh, I've never come across a convert from Islam to percent who, who reaches a high position. Uh, they're not there. Uh, definitely in the Spanish account, they're always, uh, I mean, of course, with the issue of the purity of blood, I mean, it becomes even more pronounced. But uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a kind of sense of insecurity about them, which is, so yes, I would agree, it's more or less the same, which is very strange because in, these, in, the, in the North African accounts, the Arabic North African accounts, I mean, they, would, they know you, you are, you know, Hassan al Janawi. you are Hassan from Genoa, so everybody knows that you are a convert. And yet you become, you know, the renegade, the sultan renegade. They become kind of, you know, they reach high positions of power. So the idea of conversion, as I say, is so different because the Christian idea is you are a new man. This is not a new man. The convert is simply the, the man. And, the, you know, what he had been was just a mistake or just a forgetful act. No, I say. So, yes, I would say, you know, there would be the same reaction, but the Arabic, I mean, the, the role that many, many converts from from Christian to Islam played in North African uh, military campaigns, naval campaigns, piracy, uh, even theology, even theology. Some of two of the most famous disputations by uh, against Christian was written by converts to uh, to Islam from Christianity. So that they're perfectly integrated. Um, there is no name for them, you know. That's what I said, that you, know, you don't have a name, you just have the origin from Genoa, from <coughs> Namsawi, Arusi, you know, all these uh, the terminations are there, so we know where they come from, we know their convert, but you don't have the kind of equivalent of uh, apostate, of renegade, unless you're using it to a Muslim. If a Muslim you know, leaves his religion, goes to Judaism or, uh, or Christianity, then he is a mortet. So it means it's, it's applied to a Muslim turning away, but not to a Christian or Jew who's become that. While in Christianity, the term renegade, apostate, is all over the place, which I find absolutely you know, objectionable, but that's the way it was at the time. It continues to be, which I find should be challenged. So, thank you. Thank you very much.